Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen, and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Folding in economics into fixed income, Ira Jersey joins us now from Bloomberg Intelligence. Is this jobs report enough to shift the vector of 10-year yields? I don't mean the nuance up two basis, down three basis, (laughs) Ira Jersey, but can we get a vector change in the 10-year yield off this report? Well, I, I do suspect, Tom, if we d- get a pretty strong number that the market's going to price out and, you know, almost any chance of a, a, an early cut. So meaning even a June at this point would be early. Wow. So, uh, you know, that can that can push 10 year yields up another 10, 12 basis points. Um, wow. In fact, uh, you, you know, we, we've we've moved. Well, it's not unusual these days to get, you know, eight to 12 basis point moves on um, on big misses, misses or beats in 10 year treasuries. So um, I think people are repricing things very quickly. People are very quick to get out of risk today whereas you know a few years ago everyone was just like happy to sit on their 10-year yield even at at two percent but whereas now it's it's a matter of you know hey uh, you know do we want to own this risk going into this uh, you know now that we've seen this number or you know do we want to uh you know just get out just wipe our hands of it and i i just i think we're in in that latter um that that latter stage where where risk is just very very finicky right now paul ask a question here because i just want to talk about (laughs) aston villa brentford and we can't Oh, that's that going to be. The, we can't do that into the jobs report. Dude. Tom's that's looking at the fixture, uh, which I'm the not fixture. sure what that football means. scores and fixtures. Okay, Sorry. very good. So, hey, Ira, are we? I look at the ten-year Treasury here at four point three one percent. Are we kind of in a trading range here? I don't know, four to four and a half percent. Is that kind of where we are here as, as, as you look at this market? Yeah, more, more or less. Um, yeah, the, you know, the, the high on, on the technical charts was 435, and we broke that earlier this week. And, and but but that was not a uh, convincing breakout uh, to the upside. So so I, I think that yields probably are falling back into that range. Call it 405 to 435 uh, for now. But keep in mind, the, you know, the data we're going to get in a few minutes can yeah. completely change that okay. for sure. What does the real yield signify here? I had a 2.02 10-year uh, real yield uh, Ira Jersey right now. One. 1.9 it's back a little bit 1.95 percent is that onerous to american business well i think that this is you know a lot of people would say that this is normal you know we, we got used to the 15 years from you know 20 2007 to 2022 for real yields being you know zero or negative and and now we're back at at levels that are more consistent with what occurred between the mid 90s and and the financial crisis of a uh, of, of little more than a decade ago so um so, so i think that most people would say that this is quote unquote normal uh certainly it's it's more in the range i think of what the federal reserve would like to see um you know when you look at real yields uh, over time you know when real yields are here usually still have pretty decent growth and you're certainly seeing that in some of the data iris stay with us right now as we go one minute away from the american uh, jobs report lisa mateo i have some market news and then We'll go beneath uh, the headline data. Paul Sweeney, what are you looking at within the report? It's interesting, Tom. Obviously, I'm going to be looking at the wages here. I think, you know, the average hourly earnings, you know, 0.3% on a month-to-month basis, 4.1% on a a yearly basis. That would be down from 4.3% last period. So kind of dovetails in with we still have decent wage growth, but it is moderating a little bit. Can I just go macro? Yeah. 3.8% surveyed unemployment. I don't know what it's going to be, folks, but... 10 years ago, 20 oh, years man. ago, that was like nirvana. Exactly. And it's we've like, been here for a long time. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. It's a sub 4% <laughs> unemployment rate. 45 seconds away. Let me tell you the market benchmarks I look at when we go into this. we got to talk oil. $91 a barrel on Brent crude, $87 on uh, West Texas Intermediate. But far more importantly, futures up 19. The 10 year yield is 4.32%, pretty much flat on the day, 4.32%. That two-year more Fed-friendly yield, 4.65%, 4.65% for those keeping score at home. Dollar on DXY, 104.18. That's some real obscurity. 
into a jobs report, always interesting. And of course, the revisions important as well. There it's coming go. out now. Oh. It's, it's, it's a terrible number, Paul. I mean, America, <laughs> the exceptionalism of America, the defeatism is witnessed in the report. Paul, just give me the number here. The non-farm payrolls. Are you kidding me? 303,000, Tom. <laughs> just put that in perspective. The consensus was 214,000. Uh, last period was 275,000. Uh, wages, we're talking about that up 0.3% month to month, right in line on an annualized basis, up 4.1% right in line there. But a big, big beat on the payroll number. Equities Tom. pull back a little bit. Neg a, a positive 18 down to positive 8. Just the first. People are really going to have to digest this. And I think the revision which we do not see yet is important to re there it is right now not much of a revision that's no. key yep. 270,000 from 275 so this is a hugely constructive report in terms of non-farm payrolls and you get that survey unemployment rate 3.8 percent markets pull back they now come back a little bit higher uh, futures up 13 the VIX 16.45 and in the yield space as John Farrell says a 10-year yield 4.37 percent as ira jersey said uh, the the 10-year yield lifting up nicely already up six uh, basis points our economic indicators on jobs day brought to you by our good friends at commonwealth supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business commonwealth go where you grow visit commonwealth.com to learn more ira jersey with bloomberg intelligence does the 10-year yield in the curve does it buttress up against resistance or can it break out to new higher yields but I, I think the fact that we're over 435, uh, you know, we do target four and a half percent here. So not, not necessarily today, but uh, but n nonetheless, I think that this just shows you the economic resilience of the United States right now. And it's going to be hard for the Federal Reserve to make the case to cut interest rates when the data is running <laughs> right. as strong as it is. And because of that, you'd probably get the entire curve start to move a little bit higher. Um, I wouldn't uh, I, I'm just looking at the market here. We're, you know, s very slightly bare steepening uh, with, uh, with with 10 year yields underperforming two-year yields right. by two basis points not not huge uh but i would suspect over time that you get a, a maybe a little bit more of a um just an upward shift in the yield curve right. as we price out another fed cut paul sweeney the real yield comes nicely back it was okay. 1.95 and off six basis points goes to 2.01 okay. percent and that's an indication of the lift in yields mr jersey's speaking of i follow top live on the bloomberg terminal because we have the professional journalist from bloomberg news and Enda Curran, global economy reporter, he basically says another whopper of a, a data point for the, the payroll numbers. And I'll stick with that. That seems also calling out here the participation rate has essentially recouped some of the losses since last November here. So we had the uh, participation rate just inch up a little bit. 62.7, uh, Tom. The consensus was 62.6. Last period was 62.5. So a little bit higher labor force participation rate. We have to see. Thank you for joining us on Apple CarPlay, YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Thank you for the vigorous live chat uh, this morning. Without commercial interruption ira jersey with us here for the next 11 minutes and we are thrilled to bring you right now my market economist of 2023 neil dada is with renaissance macro i can't say enough about he how he nailed the spirit of the consumer and the spirit of nominal gdp neil dada does this jobs report and just as a generalization a 214 look and I, i'm going up roughly a hundred thousand to 303 on non-farm payrolls does that signal an employed America with signals continued resilient consumer activity? Well, sure. I mean, if you take the sum product, I mean, it wasn't just the growth in jobs, Tom, but the work week actually extended. Uh, you know, remember the average work week had been a big source of concern, uh, you know, towards the end of last year, early this year, and now that's basically been recovering. Um, so it's not just the growth in jobs, it's the work week. So when you take the sum product of jobs, hours, and hourly earnings, uh, you're talking about uh, aggregate incomes growing, you know, in excess of 6%. Uh, right. With inflation um, still moderating, that's a, a push for real income growth in the aggregate uh, for the economy. Right. So that's, 
you know, I mean, that's fine for consumer spending. Neil Dutta, Joe out on live chat has a smart, I think the guy's a PhD. He's got, you know, he's got the smartest comment, Neil Dutta, in Ira Jersey. I've seen Neil to you. Here's Joe. Got to wonder, how is everyone so consistently wrong? There's the smartest analysis I've seen today. Neil Dutta, what does the gloom crew get wrong as we slide into another Dutta-like quarter? Uh, well, I, I, th- I mean, look, there, people talk about long and variable lags to, to, uh, to monetary policy, Tom. There are long and variable lags to fiscal policy. And I think that's kind of what people have missed. Um, and, you know, you talk about household balance sheets. Uh, they're quite strong. Uh, you're at a point now where, um, you know, global growth is, is starting to pick up again. Yes. Uh, a little bit, and, uh, and that's going to support uh, U.S. manufacturing activity. Um, so, you know, I do think that we talk about equal weighted uh, market indexes. Right. Equal weighted U.S. GDP is improving as well. I mean, you're going to get more growth from things like business equipment spending. You're going to get more growth from things like inventory investment, residential investment. You might get a little bit less on consumer spending uh, and government. But generally speaking, the breadth of growth in the U.S. is expanding. And I think that's important. Um, it, so in way Lee had that from yes, BlackRock. She's she talking did. about this broadening. I, I just can't say enough, folks, about a three hundred thousand <laughs> non-farm payroll. I don't care about any other babble. As Joe says, thank you out on uh, live chat on, on YouTube. Paul, we've all got this wrong. Even Lisa Mateo got this wrong. <laughs> exactly right. Hey, Neil, Tom and I have been discussing over the past few days, and Bloomberg News has been doing some very good reporting on the impact of immigration into this country You know, over the last several years, legal and illegal, and its impact on the labor market. How do you factor that in? You know, I think um, it's just important to kind of take the data as it comes to you um, and not make, you know, not try to explain it away <laughs> one way or the other. Um, What I think matters is that if the Fed is leaning into this argument that labor supply is the reason why uh, jobs growth is strong and immigration might be one part of that, it could be also rising participation rates. Um, But if labor supply is a reason why jobs growth is strong, then that doesn't mean necessarily that strong jobs growth in and of itself will push the Fed away from cuts to Powell's Powell's point. In in other words, a strong number won't push them um, away from cutting as much as a weak number will push them to cutting. So Mm, I think that's the important uh, point about this is that if labor supply is a big driver of the strong jobs growth, that's going to have important kind of uh, implications for how the Fed is thinking about interest rates. And I and I and I recognize um, that obviously the the curve is, is shifting higher. Yields are rising on the back of this report. That makes sense. But keep in mind that, you know, the inflation, I I still think is in a narrowing, uh, in, a, in a slowing path, okay? I mean, I think it's very interesting that globally, just go down the list. Canada, better than expected inflation. Switzerland, better than expected inflation. Most of Europe, better than expected yep. inflation. So the U.S. was the outlier in the first quarter, at least so far. That kind of speaks to this residual seasonality argument that the Fed's been leaning into. And at right. the same time, domestically, right. inflation expectations, guys, haven't been going up. Right. Like, so you have to kind of go to first principles, Um, even with this number, productivity probably picked up in the first quarter. And that means that unit labor costs are under control uh, because wage growth over the last three months is still running about four percent. Neil Dutta with this Renaissance Macro here. We're commercial free in this jobs report across America. Good morning. The headline out of Bloomberg News is simple. Paul Sweeney, U.S. jobs roar again. Again is the operative word. His payrolls jumped 303,000. Why don't you bring in Ira Jersey? He's been looking at what Aston Villa is going to do with Brentford. So (laughs) let's get him back into the game. Ira Jersey, chief U.S. interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence is still with us. Hey, Ira, I'm looking at a red headline across the Bloomberg terminal. Fed swap shift full pricing of rate cut to September from July. Boy, that's your market reacting pretty quickly. What do you make of that? Yeah, so, you know, the market's obviously moving 
quite a lot. And um, if you use the WRP function or if you look at our uh, SOFR option sentiment model, uh, which we run at the end of each day, um, you know, we, we were pricing for obviously six uh, 25 basis point interest rate cuts just two months ago. And now we're uh, now we're pricing uh, for actually a 15 percent chance of a hike by the end of this year. So, you know, there's been a significant seed change. And I think that this data like we are getting today just feeds into that narrative that, um, you know, it can the Fed actually cut if the data remains as good? And the answer is probably no. Um, and, uh, you, you know, but but clearly they think that they're going to need to cut. But if they're data dependent and the data is this good, it's going to be hard for them to make that case. You, you know, I agree that, that you know, when you look at the entire swath of data globally, that there are pockets of weakness, but that just hasn't fed into any of the U.S. Yeah. data yet, or, or at least enough of it to make be able to convincingly make the case that the Fed needs to yeah. cut imminently. And Paul Dutta said this as well. I mean, you go nation to nation to inflation reports. Yeah, I get there's like some inflation worries, but at the bottom line, there's a resilient disinflation that seems to be in place. I look at Switzerland, but, you know, yep. there's other places where you got some real disinflation. And Ira, just real quickly, despite the data here, I think the rhetoric, I'm kind of surprised. I think the market from time to time is surprised that the rhetoric from Fed Chairman Jay Powell continues to be on the margin dovish. What do you make of that? Well, I, I'm not sure it was dovish. I mean, what he said yesterday or, or uh, even what they said, uh, what, what a preponderance of the speaker said, they said that they're data dependent and that they won't cut if the data is resilient, that they're going to let the data lead them. So, um, And, and I, I'll take them at face value when they say that. So if you see data like this where yep. wages are growing re- decently, you have higher, uh, um, you have the higher participation rate, which is good. Uh, and at the same time, 300,000 right. jobs being created, um, you, you know, th- right. that's not an economy that's falling out of bed yet. Look for the reports. So Myra Jersey and his team here through this Friday here on how this jobs report, this roaring jobs report, folds into your fixed income space. Final comments from Neil Dutta. Neil Dutta, where's nominal GDP? And give us the Dutta view for Q3 and Q4 of this year. Well, I, th- I mean, right now, if you look at it, a nominal GDP is probably running 6% in the current quarter, maybe somewhere between 5 to 6%. So that's a pretty, wow. pretty strong number. Um, yes. But I do think that um, we are moderating. I think GDP growth is going to probably be in the 2 to 2.5% range. And I think inflation will be ar- around there, too. So we're probably going to be you know, closer to 4.5%, 5% nominal growth uh, by, the, uh, by the end of the year. And... Um, you know, again, I think for your viewers, what's important is growth in and of itself doesn't keep the Fed from cutting. I mean, this is really neutral is higher. And that means that all the Fed can really do is recalibrate policy. It doesn't necessarily mean that they can't cut at all. And I think that that's an important nuance because we're, we're used to very much the Fed either cutting a lot to one percent or zero going to zero. Right. Or, or not. And, um, you know, that kind of recalibration of policy is something we haven't really been uh, seeing in, in a while. Uh, so I, I do think that if inflation slows, I mean, that requires some adjustment of policy. Ultimately, the Fed believes they control inflation. And if inflation right. starts to come better than expected over the next few months, as I think it will, then, you know, all else equal, that means that they're running a, a bit tighter policy than they think. Neil Dutta, thank you so much. Neil Dutta with Renaissance Macro, Optimism on America. Forty-four years ago, we didn't see the American labor economy like we see it now. Who at the margins doing that? You make fun of it, but I'm sorry. Places like Zip Recruiter yep. are absolutely nailing it. On the you pulse. should see a report. We're not going to go into this massive victory lap for Julia Pollack, but her report on jobs predictions is scary prescient this morning. The optimist Julia Pollack joins us from Zip Recruiter right now. Julia, congratulations on a great non-farm payrolls call as we pop out to 300,000. What does Zip Recruiter see right now granular in your digital world? What do you see in the labor economy? 
So we see very strong participation with uh, applications per posting rising through over 10% over the year. So labor availability is high, and I think that's one reason companies keep adding workers. It's becoming easier to, to hire them. Uh, and you see that in the wage growth data today, uh, which is really a, sort of a, a, a great thing to see in this Goldilocks report. It shows a strong, strong labor market, but yeah. where uh, wages are not overheating. This is not necessarily an inflationary report. Who's hiring out there, Julia? Where are the areas that are seeing some strength? So, you know, that, the answer to that question has been very boring lately. Uh, we see the same industries uh, leading in month-over-month -month growth, year-over-year -year growth, uh, again and again and again. And it's those uh, ASIC industries, healthcare, the public sector, yep. and leisure and hospitality. Uh, but... Recently, in just the last month or two, we are starting to see signs of life in the sectors that were struggling before. Retail, uh, manufacturing, um, uh, construction. So uh, the, the rolling recession could be turning into a rolling recovery. So, Julia, you folks at ZipRecruiter, I mean, you see this data real time here. What's How has it evolved over the past couple of years in terms of people signing up to ZipRecruiter, what are they looking for? How long are they there? What's the feeling from employers? How's that evolved over the past couple of years? Well, every U.S. employer at the same time was scrambling to hire in a big hurry, and it was more competitive than ever before between about mid-2021 uh, to, to late 2022. And then, of course, uh, with the Fed's supersized rate hikes, uh, everyone became quite cautious and worried. Uh, employers were worried there'd be a downturn. Right. They didn't want to overhire into a downturn. And so we saw quite a change. Right. And for, for 20 months, we've seen a right. sort of a downward slide in online job postings. Uh, but that's turned around the last two months. Julia, you remember my new hearing. I mean, I mean, <laughs> Paul, frame this out. I mean, not only your experience at Rand and her public service with the United States Navy, she was smart enough. I mean, think of all the, the fancy people People we talk about who go to places mm -hmm. where it rains 30 days a week. <laughs> She's out of Pepperdine, which is like oh, the smartest man. place to go to college if you want. Julia, are you advantaged in your analysis of the American labor economy because you're not in three zip codes of New York or two zip codes of Washington, <laughs> D.C.? Are you advantaged because you know which pool to swim in at Pepperdine? <laughs> I do think it helps uh, to be at a remove from Washington, D.C. sometimes in Wall Street uh, and to have sort of an, an outsider's perspective. Uh, and of course, uh, okay. you know, the, the sunny California sunshine does help one to, to be an optimist. And, and oh, really? I didn't uh, know that. Okay, <laughs> it I, I hate her, Lisa. Betting against the U.S. economy. We've had a biblical deluge here. Just very quickly, <laughs> Julie, this is important. The overlay Paul and I are seeing is immigration in legal and illegal migration matter? How do you fold those in at ZipRecruiter? Well, you know, Ernie Tedeschi has uh, fantastic uh, research on this recently, and he shows that uh, our, our employment growth in the U.S. here would have been much stronger than that in Europe, even absent immigration. But immigration likely explains about 20 percent of it. Um, you know, by some estimates, 3.3 million immigrants came into the United States in 2023, well above the 1.1 million who, uh, that had been predicted before. So this is a huge source of, of uh, labor supply, but also uh, the immigrants buy services and goods and so they prop up consumer spending and revenues at businesses and, and hiring so julia take this labor data that we received today as well as some of the other data we've received over the past uh, couple of weeks what do you think the federal reserve is going to do here what's your view at zip recruiter well, i think the federal reserve will be pretty happy to see this data i mean their, their dual mandate after all is to keep the labor market strong and prices under control. And this report seems to say we can do both. We can walk and chew gum. Uh, we can create lots and lots of jobs and have a healthy economy without uh, wage growth uh, you know, causing a, a wage price spiral. Um, so I think uh, three cuts are not off the table after this report. Julia, thank you so much. Congratulations on a shockingly prescient pre-labor economy <laughs> report. She's out of two. always worried about getting angle on that space. Yeah, <laughs> I, well, the jobs it, report. yeah, I don't make predictions anymore because I've been wrong. If you're wrong for 20 years, you just give up. Julia Pollock at 250,000 and we clocked in at a solid 300,000.
what happens, folks, in the blur that we have, and that you know the difference is Paul's got a beverage in his hand, yep. looking at the surfs up in New Jersey. <laughs> I'm at home with that bill, going, "Oh my God, another economic report." And then there's something that just stops you in your tracks. As a research economist, Claudia Sam has done this for years. It's not a one-off. She's transformed economics with the Sam rule. I'm not going to go into it. Her work at Michigan, her work at the Fed. And then the other day, she wrote an absolutely definitive essay for Bloomberg on part-time employment. Dr. Sam joins us on this uh, jobs day. Claudia, I'm going to cut to the chase. Part-time employment is second-rate employment. Is it? Not necessarily. Part-time employment gives people flexibility. When we need to really look hard at it, in particular, is when we find out people are working part-time, but they'd rather be working full-time. Economic conditions are bad. They got their hours cut. They can't find a job. Like That's when it's really bad. Now, we can always make part-time jobs better, but they do have flexibility for people who say have caregiving, other responsibilities. They just can't do full-time. Part-time for economic reasons is really low, and we needed those part-time jobs to come back so that people can have that flexibility. How does immigration and the new fears of America over migration fold into part-time America? Somebody coming across the border, somebody coming into JFK or LAX, they're going to take four jobs and take away my job. Speak to that stereotype. Immigrants are one of the heroes in this labor market recovery. You don't see the headlines anymore about the labor shortages. We got more labor, not fewer customers. That's what the Fed does. Immigrants are not the only group, but they have come in big time and taken jobs that were open. Right? We have not seen the unemployment rates for U.S. born individuals rising. It's more for the foreign born because it takes a little while to get all the papers or find the job. So really they solved a big problem and are taking pressure off of employment. So when we think about them in the labor market and the they're doing some real good. Uh, Claudia, again, uh, the really strong non-farm payroll data coming out today. I want to focus on the average hourly earnings here on an annualized basis, 4.1%, ticking down a little bit from last period, 4.3%. How do you think about the the wage environment in the U.S. labor market? So in general, we've seen the labor market really settle into a good a good rhythm. Right? We had a big payroll number today, but you look back over several months, they've been pretty good, little change. Like if we settle into an expansion, and the same goes for wages. We have seen wages be stronger, and yet on, inflation has been coming down. Right? We can have a more productive, more workers and that can support a more dynamic economy. So wage growth is probably still going to come down some. We are still working through, you know, getting the workers in and um, we're not going to see the big wage gains again during the labor shortages. It's probably what we should expect. We got to get to a sustainable expansion. And yet there's no reason to fear those numbers. Right? They have not been inflationary in the way that some people were worried a year or two ago. So, Claudia, um, just looking at the futures markets uh, and the Fed swaps here, it looks like the market's pushing out a rate cut. Uh, maybe that June isn't even a lock anymore. How do you think the Federal Reserve's going to react to some of the could data today? Could you see today? her as a governor of the Fed? Oh, absolutely. My, yeah. could you, <laughs> right when vote. they, when yeah. they order out pizza, Claudia would go nuts. I mean, exactly. it'd be like a healthier diet. Exactly. Claudia, yeah. how do you think the Fed's going to react to some of the data we saw today? So the Fed leaves, lives in the real world. Right. So they're looking at these jobs. But next week is really the main event. OK. Right. They have said multiple times inflation has got to come down. They are not weighing in on, oh, the unemployment rate is too high or the economy is growing too strong. That's not their job. Right. They've got to get inflation down to two percent and unemployment low. And if this economy, you know, has, you know, the legs and can keep running, that is not for the Fed to step in and stop. They don't want to. They just want their dual mandate and their job is done. So, I, but I, I see it like I'm uncomfortable with the fact that we don't talk about the risk to the labor market. And yet, I mean, frankly, you get these good jobs numbers, you know, it likely unless right. something blows up, it'll take time. And this is a very like, you know, they're 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 really scared of acting too fast. So, yeah, I think pushing things out, right. I do not see them not cutting. I think that is too uh, pessimistic. You know, I, I look, Claudia, it's your wonderful essay. And you've got out of Vanderbilt, Rachel Donnelly and Adam Schoenbachler. 
talking about the difference of the states of all of our audience. You got states with high wages, high social benefits. They've got a different attitude than states that say, go out and get a job. We're not going to give you any benefits. Who has a better labor economy out of that? What I like to say about this labor market is take the win. We have had a massive recovery and frankly move past that in terms of working on some structural problems we had before and yet keep pushing. Right. Like there are ways and particularly people on the margins, part time jobs fit in that space. Also, low paid full time jobs. Not every job in this country is good enough. A lot of them are even those have gotten better. And yes, these researchers looked at the importance of decoupling a lot of the benefits that we need from employment and particularly from full time employment. And it pays dividends to people, obviously, and it makes our economy more productive. Workers that are really engaged, like, right. they, they can do more. And Paul, I think one thing not spoken about here is what percentage of a paycheck is consumed, is yeah. spent yeah. right We're away. Saying. And I think there's a whole bunch of people in the Bloomberg world, I'm as guilty of this as anyone, that go, well, they're maxing out their 401k and they're saving for this <laughs> and they're gonna buy a Rivian baloney. They're spending their money in the they economy. Are. So Claudia, let's go right there. I mean, again, with this backdrop of a strong labor market, how do you view the consumer these days? Well, the American consumer is strong. Right. And, and if you get a, uh, a virtuous cycle going between a strong labor market and a strong consumer, that really can keep the U.S. economy going. And the reality is a lot of Americans, either by need or by choice, spend their paychecks. Right. But we also saw that when people were getting yeah. more money, particularly at the bottom, they will put some away. That quote unquote excess savings, that was because we gave people the money they needed to be able to right. save. Claudia, I, I, Ross has a brilliant live chat comment here. Thank you, Ross, for cutting to the chase. And maybe this is unfair, Claudia, but I'm going to take a shot with your holistic view of our nation. What's the distinction between legal and illegal immigrants or migrants? What's the partition right now that Dr. Sam sees between, between somebody coming in legal, doing the paperwork and that, they're in Queens, New York, whatever, New Jersey, whatever, and somebody coming over the border illegal? All right, so I very specifically kept my lens on the labor market and solving labor shortages. And in that sense, I mean, if people can get a job as immigrants, then they're filling a job that was open. Right. It's it, so I won't go into I mean, obviously, people coming in in different paths uh, have different constraints on them. A lot of the people coming into the country right now that don't have permanent legal status are individuals that were waiting for hearing if they can get asylum status or not. And for them, it takes longer to get right. the paperwork legally work. So, yes, there are different groups. But at the end of the day, they are contributing to our economy. And that's in that space like that's an important lens right. to take dr sam thank you so much really controversial i can't i'll get it out this weekend folks spectacular bloomberg opinion essay from claudia sam on this raging debate over full-time part-time employment Bloomberg Surveillance and our newspapers with Lisa Mateo. Misery in order. I'm surrounded by Yankee fans. Joining us now <laughs> after the success of Jess Menton the other day on Yankees opening day, Damian Sassauer. Hi, Tom. Can they really play at the caliber of the Braves and the Dodgers? 81-39-1 all-time in home openers. They've won six of the last seven since 2017. Stroman facing his former team after two years with the Cubs. I think he's a 0. 0.00 ERA. Let's go. Stroman is a Duke guy. Stroman is a Duke guy. Stroman, oh, but Marcus Stroman to me is is really a linchpin here. Yeah, in that you need for well, Nestor youth, Cortez you, isn't you know. You need so a great. Johnny Padres. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You yeah. got to have a number three. Is Stroman their number three? Well, I think Stroman could actually. I mean, the way he's pitching, I mean, again, he could be a number two. I mean, certainly we need Cort you know Cortez has not been well, but I mean, right. let's just let's just take a second here and enjoy the fact that the Red Sox swept the A's in Oakland. Mm -hmm. That's one of the last Sacramento times at the Coliseum. Or Oakland. Okay. They're in second place in the East. You know, our little brothers. They're up north, you know, so we're really happy with that. 
Really happy. Mike with that. from Bedford just emailed in and said, "Tom, you'll love the Orioles, Tom." Yeah. <laughs> just, just so you know, let's get started. Damien Sassar with us here. Lots to talk about. Damien, join us. Yes. In the please. Mateo moment, Lisa, what do you have? All right. So we're starting with the Wall Street Journal. They broke down how far a hundred dollars goes at the grocery store after five years of food inflation. So they're saying they got the information, they analyzed Nielsen IQ data of commonly purchased item, items that were valued of $100 in 2019. Today, that same grocery list costs 36.5% more. Wow. The biggest price surge, yep. eggs, sports drinks, that climbed about sports 40%. Drinks. Shoppers would have to remove about $37 of items to spend that same amount as they did in 2019. To me, this so is How much do you think a Fen Dog, a Fen Dog uh, by Pesky Paul, you think a Fen Dog's going to be expensive <laughs> yeah, this year? A little bit higher, yeah. I guess. And the problem is, Lisa, those prices, they don't come down per se, right? right, and the, right. So the rate of inflation is lower. That's a good story. But okay. I'm getting less uh, in my in my bread basket. I $14.50 ordered, for a Fen Dog. I ordered <laughs> yesterday, and for the first time in ages, I ordered, like, expensive beef. Mm-hmm. $28 oh, yeah. a pound. Paul, what's that piece of wow. beef go in those fancy steakhouses you eat at? I, exactly. Are you up to 80 bucks? Uh, well, actually, a couple <laughs> nights ago, we were at the top place locally, uh, and it was $58 for my Ooh. New York strip. Uh, no, I take them back. Ten ounces? $68. I take them back. $68. $68. Ten, it's 12 ounces. Uh, 10, to, ounces. To me, Lisa, 10 ounces. 10 ounces? Yes. I know we have to move on, but Lisa, to <laughs> me, goodness. this is the number one election thing other yeah. than immigration and migration. Yep. People, I'm sorry, it's... I mean, fancy people like us are pounding. Can you, I mean, half of America's going, what is this about? Continue. We could talk on this all day. Okay, so the price of gold, we've been talking about that, right? Hitting records. Young investors are turning to it, and they're getting it at Costco, my what? favorite place. Yes, okay, so they get the gold bars and a dollar for like 50 hot dog at the same time. Imagine that, right? <laughs> no. So you can go online, select stores in the jewelry department, but they're selling out fast. They limit two right. bars per person, that's it. But gold buyers are saying that Costco's prices, they're lower right. than they see at other retailers. We and see, then the younger generation. We digress generation. and we have an expert with us. Gold, 2300 Is China buying at the margin? Uh, they are. I mean, gold's up 10% year to date, but what's really interesting is you got Brent up 18%, you got copper up 9.2%. I mean, gold, copper and gold are only up 3% a few weeks ago. But so is it's been it a really China big buying move. at the margin? That's at the, the margin, absolutely. Debate. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's not just China, it's other central banks as well. But reserves are rebuilding and being replenished across the emerging market sphere. We can talk about all the smart stuff if you want to. <laughs> well, we, have to we have to balance it between <laughs> yeah. You know, you made an interesting point. I just want to highlight this. We have payrolls coming up. But the difference between the payroll, the establishment survey, and the household survey, Anna Wong, our chief economist, talking about this on the tape this morning. J.P. Morgan's been talking about this. This is why we see unemployment ticking up. But these huge payroll numbers, it's because not only are we getting more people being hired, but the labor force is rising because of immigration, immigration. and yeah. migrant workers, yeah. as you point out. you weren't listening in the last hour, we discussed this. <laughs> yeah. with, with cameras with, uh, and listening. Jennifer Lee at Beano. Oh, okay. <laughs> Next. All right. Uh, Four Seasons Yacht Trips. They're going to be the priciest way now to we're cruise. Talking. Now we're yes. Talking. Okay. They're debuting their first 95 suite vessel in January 2026. Are you ready for the price? Seven nights in the Caribbean <clears throat> costs no less than 20000 per suite, up to 330000 for that nearly 10,000 square foot glass enclosed suite if you want the fancy yep. one. That's, so that's how much you're spending. That doesn't include food. That doesn't okay. include drinks. <laughs> no, right. that's, that's separate. But what you get is more space. Sure. Because they're saying it's the same size as other cruise ships that carry like 700 passengers. They'll only carry 222 max. That's a difference. That's my kind Just of cruising. Because so, you don't like people. Exactly. I don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way so to you go. Like, you, know, it was only, you don't like the buffet? You were, you were born for Bloomberg surveillance. <laughs> One more, Lisa. What do you got? All right. How to take the perfect selfie during total solar eclipse. Total solar There is a way to do yeah. this. Okay. So the light can make it tough to take the selfie because a lot of people are going to be doing this. So you have to take them and wear red or green outfits on the day of the eclipse because the sky grows darker. The colors become a little bit muted. So you have to pop. But it can be dangerous. Right. That is the thing that we want to point out. Even though you're facing away yeah. from the sun, those UV rays can bounce off your phone screen into your eyes. Did yeah. you know that? Yeah. Okay. And you have to make sure you're wearing those solar eclipse glasses because there are a lot of phony ones out there. I, we well, got ours from Walmart. You did? Did yeah. you? Yeah. 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 Okay. They're really, See? really Overliable. serious folks. Really, re even, and we're not in the total eclipse. Rochester, New York is mm -hmm. sort of northwest of here. 
is very, very dangerous. And, dangerous, and you yes. got to have legitimate, I'm sure Walmart vetted them, <laughs> yeah. uh, I things. But the thing I want to mention is even if it's cloudy and you can't see the sun and the moon, the darkness is spectacular. Ah. It can be four minutes, five minutes. It's the middle of the day. The birds go mental. Damien Sassauer mm-hmm. goes mental. Was it 1 p.m. It today? can be very, very... Monday. 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 Some guy just emails in and says, Tom, you look like the assistant to the traveling secretary <laughs> of the New York Yankees. George Costello. But I mean, the, the Yankees pushed back their time, the starting time for the game Monday because oh, of the right? eclipse. Yeah, so it's going to be... I thought it was because of my tea time. No, no. <laughs> no. That's not right. Well, didn't a certain president, former president, just look right into the sun? He did fine. He did. Oh, he did. <laughs> uh, it's not funny. I, it's, well, it's like... Oh. <laughs> This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.